Are you called? Every person on the face of the earth, this world, needs to know what is their calling. Are you called? It is a very simple question, but it is maybe one of the most important questions of your life. Maybe you are hearing this message today through this broadcast in Afghanistan or in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or you are in the middle of a desert like many people that they watch my programs through their iPhones and they look and they find a glimpse of hope and I want to ask you today, are you called? To what? To who? Even in the 80s, has to ask this question, am I called? And here in book of Romans, the first chapter, we are seeing an amazing, amazing opening of Apostle Paul, a man that was called and changed the nations for Jesus Christ. Very simple statement. How many of you know that the word of God is very simple? There are things that are complicated or we make them complicated because we don't seek the Holy Spirit. And we try to make sense by ourselves. But Jesus came down on earth and he spoke simple. He said, I am the bread of life. Simple. He said, I am the living water. Simple. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Simple. But man made it complicated. And here Paul is opening up the book of Romans, which is his letter to the church in Rome. The centerpiece of the entire empire, Roman Empire. And this is what he's saying in the first verse. That sometimes we miss those greetings. But in his greeting, there's so much profound wisdom. This is what he says. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. A servant of Christ. Paul is saying who he was and his identity is in Jesus Christ, in a wicked city, a handful of believers, he's writing this letter. At that time, city of Rome had one million people, and 40 to 50,000 of them were Jewish people. And then you cut down even more, the church was a lot smaller, smaller than that. So in his ministry, Paul didn't start with mega churches. He didn't start glorious. He didn't start with fireworks and smoke machines or anything. But he started very simple to his calling. And it did not matter what he'd been through. It did not matter how much he was persecuted, shipwrecked, naked, hungry. Did not matter. You know why? Because he knew his calling. And he knew that every calling comes with a price tag. Do you have a calling? Do you know your calling today? Or you knew it so long ago and then something happened to that calling that it is sitting on a shelf today and all in dust. And you've all forgot about it. Maybe the trials and tribulations and persecutions and slanders, malice, all kinds of stuff came into your life and betrayals. And then you said, this is not for me, which many do. I remember years ago, we had an amazing TV broadcast, live TV broadcast to the Middle East. People were ca calling uh, the phone lines, and so many people were calling from Turkey and Iran and even Afghanistan. Even someone called from Sweden that didn't understand my language. And she said, I cannot believe it. In English, she, she was speaking, I cannot believe it. I was just uh, checking the channels. And then I saw you, and I just loved this passion. I didn't know what you were talking about, and I, am not, I don't know anything about Jesus. But I started understanding what you are saying. And I want to receive him into my heart. 
and she got saved. So that was this one of the most supernatural and amazing TV programs I have ever done. And I, after that program, I was like, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I was prostrate. I was completely, utterly humbled by the mighty move of God. And I said, Lord, thank you. This is what I said, actually. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for calling me. And I remember him saying, you are not my first choice. And it was like kind of a, you know, arch <laughs> for him to say that. And I was like, I am not your first choice. And it, that was kind of, he was not trying to be mean, but he was telling me the reason that he had to reveal that to me. Because how many of you know that we do things without a purpose many times, but God doesn't say or do anything without a purpose. Maybe today you are going through something in your life and you are thinking, what is the purpose in this trial? And you are thinking, what is the purpose in this? But you need to pray about that because something amazing may come out of that situation. And God said, I just want you to know, I called two men before you. And they didn't obey the calling. They didn't want to pay the price, not only obey, because that obedience comes with the price tag. So he said, they didn't want to do the work. They didn't want to show their faces on TV, and they didn't want to pay the price tag. And this is why you are my third choice, which became first, because of your obedience. But the reason I am telling you this, he said, you need to remain humble and steadfast in your calling. Because God was preparing me for the trials that I was going to face. So I would not quit when I faced those trials. Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus. The first thing Paul is saying, he's not saying I am an apostle. He's not saying I'm a man of God. He's not saying... It, miracles and signs and wonders follow me. I am this and that. The first thing he says, I am a servant of Christ Jesus. His identity was not evolved around his degrees and his knowledge or his titles or anything. But his identity was evolved around his servanthood. And he was so mindful of that. Because I have to tell you something, I don't care how many PhDs or doctor degrees or education you have, it doesn't matter how many titles, CEOs, CFOs, general manager, you can own the entire world, but unless you become a servant of God, you are nothing. And your titles mean nothing. When God called someone, Look at my servant Job. Look at my servant Abraham. That was the highest title God could give to anyone. And this is what Paul acknowledges. His first and foremost identity, foundation of his ministry as a servant. And he says, a servant of Christ called to be an apostle which apostle in Greek word means send forth. Send forth to plant, establish, and build. Send forth. This is what ap apostle is. Now, nowadays you see many people, they come and they introduce themselves to you. I am prophet so and so. I, I've been to churches since coming from Islam. I just want you to know I, be, I have seen it all. And people even have on their business cards, prophetess. They have given me business card, apostle. And I have no problem with that as long as it is not counterfeit. God can call and ordain anybody. He's God. And it's not my place to qualify or disqualify anyone. But I can tell you one thing. That is a sign of a prophet. That is a sign of an apostle. It's a servant. Servant and humility. You know what it takes to carry an office of a prophet, office of an apostle? It is in this book. 
It is net and clear through their lifestyle. And this is next one, Paul is telling us that we can see that this is what he says, called to be an apostle and set apart. I just love this word, set apart. Set apart means consecrated. I am not part of the world. I am of the world, but not part of the world. I'm set apart for a different use, different purpose. I'm set apart. That little, little statement tells you, that statement tells you the commitment and the passion of Apostle Paul. I'm set apart. That is the cost too. Being set apart is a cost too because if you are called into the ministry, you cannot do the things that even forget pagans are doing because some Christians, they do what pagans are doing. And this is why you cannot separate church from the world. When you look and somebody says, I'm a Christian, you say, wow, oh, you really? And this is not a judgment. I, I have to tell you, if that person is only one year in the Lord, it's okay. But after 10 years or 15 years, 20 years, you see them struggling with the same bondages that they are struggling all their lives. You start questioning, where is the power of Jesus Christ in that person's life? You know, one thing I can tell you, they are not living a set apart life. Because we are all called and not we are all answering. And Paul says here, I am set apart. I made up my mind to be set apart for the Lord. I made up my mind to take sabbaticals and pray more than I was praying before. And I, coming from Islam, it's not a difficult thing for me to set apart, uh, put a time frame, I am going to pray, it's, it's easy. Or I am going to fast, it's easy. I was disciplined that way. Maybe for some of you it's not an easy thing to fast. Or it's not an easy, uh, but for me, I was disciplined that way. And God uses everything. God used Paul's background. He was the Pharisee of the Pharisees, and God was using him. And he uses my previous past former life as a discipline in my present life. And I was going to, and I, I am about to go to the same place in Europe in a couple of weeks, and I go every year. This is a big networking event. And I hate networking, Christian business events. I don't like it. It's not, I am not judging it. It is just not, I am not in my environment. When I go to these places, it's not, it's not me. So I go to those places. I am originally an introvert. And you shake hands, you, change, you exchange business cards, you know, one person to another. And my, my head gets very dizzy. It's difficult. It's not my gift. It's not my calling. But I have to go to represent the ministry. And when I went there first time, God started calling me to con consecrate myself. And I said, you're asking me this here? <laughs> when I'm in, in the midst of all these hundreds of people, big conference, and everybody wants to talk to me? He said, yes. Are you going to obey or, or are you going to dismiss? Because sometimes you hear something and then you dismiss it. Then you wonder later on why God is not speaking to you because you keep dismissing the voice of the Holy Spirit. So he said, this is what I want you to do. And I went there with a crew. I, I had a team with me. So we had schedules. And I had to text everybody and say, I am not able to fulfill this schedule because I have to come. This is what God spoke to me. He said, all morning, I want you to, and I was waking up very early to spend time with him. He said, I want you to praise and worship. Pray, praise and worship. And I want you to get out of your room at noon, exactly every day, same time. Which was the biggest meetings were taking place to 9 to 12 o'clock. And when I texted this to my team and the head of my team, the gentleman that who is in charge of business development with a big title, he said, no, we are going to miss all these events and meeting with these people. I said, if you know me, you need to take my no as an answer. And he's like, okay, after a few try, because there were people that, you know, around me, you know, that, that the moment you are called, you need to understand this from this story. 
The people are going to come to distract you. People are going to invite you to places. People are going to justify why this meeting is so important, why this baby shower is so important, why this bridal shower is so important. So you can be distracted because enemy doesn't only work with discouragement, he does, or hopelessness, he does, but he also works through distraction. If he can get you distracted, wow, he stole your calling. He stole your focus. This is so important that you understand that you need to remain focused when you are set apart. So I, I had to stand so firm because these people were really pressuring me. And I want you to understand, every time you are being pressured by people, it is demonic. When people pressure you to put weight on you, it is, it is a beginning of oppression. It's a beginning of spirit of oppression. If you don't say no to that, you are opening a wide door to the devil to come and completely and utterly hurt you. You can get hurt, your ministry can get hurt when you are not dealing with the pressure at the very beginning. So I said finally, what kind of no you don't understand? Am I saying no with an accent? I am not coming out of my room until noon. And then they said, okay. We change everything, we switch everything, and they did. I have to tell you, I, I did what God called me to do, and every single day when I got out of my room at 12 noon, 12 noon, everything my ministry needed was completely provided by God without any meeting. And how? I can tell you, I got out of my room, my hotel room, I would walk into the conference place in, in the same hotel, and somebody would come and find me and say, you know what, I know about your ministry and you have these needs. Do you need a camera? Do you need this? Do you need a salary to pay to a cameraman? Do you need funds for that? People were coming and asking me without I was going to anyone even giving my business card to them or anything, which I, I, I didn't carry any business card. When you obey the voice of God, when you follow his calling in your life, you are going to live that set-apart life. Are you called? You cannot hide things. Another one. When you are under God's radar, you cannot hide the things that you used to hide. And you, those are maybe small stuff, but you can. i give you an example. Before I accepted God's calling, I could do things behind my husband's back, the simple form of manipulation, shopping, you can imagine, the sin of many women. But after I started obeying God's calling in my life, I could not do those things. I had to line up with him, and I had to live in unity. And another one, you can't sugarcoat the truth. You must speak what God gives you. Because enemy will come after your authority when you are called. He will come after your voice when you are called. And he wants to silence you. You may be so, too passionate. Maybe sound too judgmental or sound this or that. And enemy loves to silence the children of God. You know why he loves that? Because Ephesians 2.2 2 says, the devil is the prince of air. Satan is prince of air. Prince of air. And the moment you start speaking into the existence, you are defeating the enemy. This is why it is important. It is not a Pentecostal doctrine or it's not a charismatic doctrine or anything. This is the word of God. The moment you open your mouth, you are not a victim of the prince of air anymore. And you see it in every case of the victims, they cannot speak up. This is why parents have to teach their children to scream or back off when a predator comes. This is the first and most primitive form of protecting yourself. It's the same way with the devil. Because he's the prince of air, he hears, he is in the airwaves and hears and moves. Because spirit is breath, spirit is a wind, whether it is demonic or it is holy. It is. This is why people confuse familiar spirits with the Holy Spirit. But what you need to do is to speak up. Speak up. 
So Paul's boldness was coming from speaking up. When you are called, you have to be bold. And only through the spirit of fire, only through the Holy Spirit's baptism, you can receive that kind of boldness to speak into the atmosphere, to existence, proclaim and declare the word of God. Which we see it here, verse 14. This is what Paul says. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not going to shut my mouth when it comes to speaking and declaring and proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to shrink back. I, I don't care where I am. If God is going to tell me to speak, I am going to speak. Because I am not ashamed. Because I have, Paul is saying, that kind of boldness. But for that kind of boldness, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. For that kind of boldness, you need to have the assurance of your calling. You cannot be, I used to be double-minded about my calling. And people used to say, oh, God is calling you to this ministry. And I was not even sure while I was doing the work of God. But then one day God rebuked me. Whether you know or rest of your life, you live in conflict. Conflict of my calling and conflict of you, your flesh. Whether you're going to say I'm cold, without worrying about that you will look prideful or this or that. No, I'm cold. I'm cold to this. I'm cold to be set apart. When people say, wow, you, you're taking sabbatical tomorrow too or taking entire month? I turn off my phone, I didn't answer anybody. You're going to look weird. PR, people, Christian people even in the church are going to judge you. Is it, is it normal? What is normal? What is normal? When you look at John the Baptist, do you think he looked normal? When you look at Paul, do you think he looked normal? When you look at Moses, Tell me all the giants of faith in the Bible, any of them, and any of their actions look normal. When people, the saints, march around the walls of Jericho and shouting, was it normal? And that takes me to tell you to my favorite scripture, 1 Corinthians, first chapter, verse 25. God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. When you are called, you are not going to worry about how you look to the eyes of the world. When you are called, it doesn't matter. You will carry your cross. You deny yourself. You deny the words that even in your close circles, your friends are giving you, oh, what am I going to be? And there was someone telling me, am I going to become a monk <laughs> if, if I do this, right? The, who cares? You are called. And you're going to just fulfill your calling. And you're going to look foolish. You are going to look different. You are going to stand out without wanna, wanna be stand out. You are going to. But God called you each and every one of you uniquely. You don't have someone else's calling in your life. That person next to you is, doesn't have your calling, but you have to fulfill the requirements of God in your calling. My assistant is here. When she applied for, a, for the position, immediately when we had, had an interview, I said, wow, this is the woman of God I want to work with. But I told her, I want you to pray tonight, and I want you to go and see the workplace that you are going to work. 
If you are not sure 500% that you are called into this ministry, don't text me. Don't tell me anything. But if you are sure 500% that you are called to this ministry, because this ministry comes with a price tag, it comes with warfare. We are entering into the Muslim world. We are entering into the territory of Antichrist. And he's not going to give everything to us on a silver plate. I had people in the previous times, they said, I take a bullet for you, and they ran away. The first difficult task or persecution or rebuke or correction they have seen. This is not a ministry for a wimp. This is a ministry for a warrior. And this is what I told her. Text me. Let me know if you are called 500%. She's sitting here today, tells you about her answer. She texts me. She said, I am called to this ministry for 500%. And today I want to ask you, what is your calling? God has a purpose in your life. Wherever you are, he has a purpose in your life. Today you are watching this program. With a, it's, this is not an accident. Through satellite TV, through smartphone apps, on Facebook, you are watching this program. And God is calling your name right now. And the name of that God is God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, Yahweh, great I am, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. He's calling your name. He's your maker and your creator. What is your answer to his calling? <laughs>